Hi, Linda. Uh, if you're ready, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm ready. <laughs> Wonderful. So um, pleased to introduce Linda Siddick, who is going to talk about um, her wonderful series of books um, and her new book, Counting Crows. So welcome, Linda. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Thank you, everyone, for uh, tuning in to see this. But I'm going to start off first with just a, a quick recap of the series. <clears throat> because there are three books in the series, Threads of Courage. And the very first book, which is called um, Cut from Strong Cloth, shows this protagonist right here, who is Ellen Canavan. She was a real person who lived in Philadelphia during the 1850s, um, 60s, and 70s. And she had this wonderful idea. She knew that soldiers' uniforms were 100% wool, scratchy and hot. And she came up with the idea that if she could design a blended cloth of wool and cotton, she could sell it to the American government for soldiers' uniforms. But being a female, and especially an Irish Catholic, an educated female, she couldn't find anyone to back her. And then she went to this factory, which might be a little hard to see, but this is my great-grandfather's factory in Philadelphia in 1861, the Nolan factory. And she convinced him to become her uh, business mentor and to take her on, and together they would um, construct this cloth. They traveled to Savannah in early April 1861 to get the cotton contracts for the cloth. And while they were in Savannah, Fort Sumter gets fired upon and the Civil War explodes around them. There are two Yankees stranded in the South, and they have to find their way back to Philadelphia. And so this book is the entire story of how that whole thing happened, how they eventually fell in love and got married. Unfortunately, Ellen contracted tuberculosis at the age of 29 and died. And my great-grandfather got all the credit for the cloth, and he became a very wealthy man. So I wrote this first book in the series to honor Ellen Canavan because I felt that her story really deserved to be told. And this became the first book. It did so well that my publisher said, let's do a second book. And I said, well, Ellen dies at 29. I don't know what else I could write. And my publisher said, well, what about the rest of the family? So I started thinking about it, and I realized that her brother's children had grown up in Philadelphia, but then had become teachers. And I placed them on a teaching um, uh, adventure, let's say, that they went to Western Maryland in 1894 to become teachers. When they arrived there in 1894, a vicious coal mining war has just started, and they become swept up in it. And in 1894, the United Mine Workers is a fledgling union, only a few years old, and they have called for a massive coal strike all across the United States that would really cripple the coal industry, because the coal industry had lowered all of the miners' pay from um, 50 cents a ton and uh, coal to 40 cents a ton. And so this is in Western Maryland. There are, it is the largest coal seam in the uh, eastern United States. The coal from there even powered the Titanic. There are 22 small villages. They all have coal mining and uh, mines there, and they all go on strike except for three. Three of the villages refused to strike, and that's where I placed the story of the village called Porter's Glen, where the miners refused to strike. It's a lot of violence that went on there, and one of the stories that grew out of it was a vigilante mob was on its way to Porter's Glen at 6.30 in the morning, but the women of Porter's Glen had found out about the vigilante mob the day before, and they were there uh, stretched across the road at 6.15 in the morning, babies on their hips, um, blocking the road so that the vigilante mob could not get to um, Porter's Glen and to their um, and to their husbands. So this was the second book, and then this book did really well. And my publisher said again, "All right, let's keep going." And so I thought, well, the natural thing would be then to go with the third generation, which would be um, the, a, a child from um, Ellen's 
niece, niece and nephew. And that was my third story, and that became Counting Crows. And Counting Crows is an old Irish superstition, and by the end, I will um, explain to you exactly what it means. But I want to share with you first the, um, the inspiration I had for how I was going to write this book. And to do that, I have to take you back to 1911. I want to take you back to a very chilly March morning in 1911 in New York City. There are 146 young girls, young women, and they all live in New York City's Lower East Side. And they march en masse to work every day. They have to go west several blocks to get to Greenwich Village. And these 146 girls are all employed by the Triangle Shirtwaist Company. Um, they work six days a week, 10-hour days, and their sweatshop factory is $4 a week. And because they're immigrants, they're grateful to have jobs. None of them can read and write English. Very few of them can even speak fluent English, but they're grateful to be employed. So together, they reach the uh, building on the edge of Greenwich Village, and they pile into the two freight elevators that will take them up to the eighth and ninth floor of the Triangle Shirtwaist Company. Now, once they get to their workroom, I want you to envision the space of a school cafeteria, because that's about how large the workrooms were at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. And I want you to imagine instead of cafeteria tables, there are long wooden tables. They are crammed on both sides with girls. And the girls are either cutting out patterns or they're pinning patterns or they're cutting fabric or they're at a sewing machine. And there are so many sewing machines that the clacking of the sewing machines literally drowns out the hum of all uh, human voices. Under the tables are large bins of overflowing scraps of cotton, and all the scraps are highly flammable. On above the tables are tissue paper patterns hanging from the ceiling, and they look like this. They're cut with holes and notches so that the girls don't have any instructions to read. They just have to follow what the tissue paper pattern shows them to do. And these hang hung from the ceiling like prom decorations. They're all above the tables. Now at 4.50, the closing bell rings and the girls are, have 10 minutes to close up their station and, and get ready to go home for the, for the night. And what happens next has never been documented, but somebody, most likely the floor supervisor, flicked a lit cigarette stub to the floor. But instead of falling on the floor, it fell into one of the scrap bins. And it only took a few minutes before the scraps caught on fire. Once the scraps caught on fire, the, the wooden tables above them with all the bolts of cotton also caught on fire. And then the flames leaped up towards the ceiling where all the tissue paper is hanging and all the tissue paper patterns caught on fire. And pretty soon the fire just went zigzag across the entire um, factory uh, workroom. And within 10 minutes, the entire workroom was engulfed in flames. Now, panic sets in, obviously. Um, the girls are rushing for the main exit. There are only two exit doors to this workroom and one is permanently locked so the girls can't take an extra bathroom break. So that means all 180 people in this workroom all have to rush for the one front exit door. And that door has been narrowed so that only one person at a time can leave and the night watchman can inspect your bag to make sure you're not stealing scraps. Well, with 180 desperate people to get to the door, people stampede, people are knocked to the ground, and the possibility for everybody to escape is very, very slim. As the fire turns into literally a raging inferno, the girls begin to realize they have very hope of staying, very slim chance of staying alive. And 62 of them rush for the windows, which have been blown out by the fire, and they jump from the eighth floor down to the sidewalk below, and none of them are saved. In the meantime, the New York City Fire Department arrives with its ladders and its hoses, but the ladders only go up to the sixth floor. Finally, the fire is contained, but not in time to save human lives. When the body count was done the next day, 82 of those girls died from either being burned to death, uh, smoke inhalation, or suffocating, and 62 of them died by jumping out the windows, and their bodies still lay on the sidewalk below. It still ranks today as the worst um, uh, factory uh, disaster in New York City history. 
And I have just disappeared from the screen, so I am going to keep talking and hope that everything is working. Hold on one moment. There I go. All right. So what I wanted to do was pay tribute to the victims of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. And I decided when I was going to write my third book of Counting Crows, I would take Maggie Canavan, who was the third generation, and I would bring her to New York City. So I started the book having her read an archival event of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire and being totally appalled. Uh, in a twist of fate, she has the opportunity to leave Porter's Glen, Maryland, this little coal mine in town, and go to Greenwich Village, New York City, for the summer. She's going to live with her aunt who runs a hat shop, and Maggie's going to take art lessons in New York City. She doesn't realize that Greenwich Village is a bohemian lifestyle that will just draw her in. She attends feminist luncheons. She goes to art galleries. She attends very controversial lectures on um, contraceptives because birth control at this time is still illegal in the United States in 1918. She finds a very vibrant lifestyle in uh, Greenwich Village and she begs her parents to let her stay for a year. And as she gets more and more involved in Greenwich Village, she discovers the sweatshop industry and how all of the women in the sweatshop industry are being taken advantage of on a tremendous scale. And Maggie decides that she's going to try and do something about it. Now, not until the flu pandemic hits, the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic hits New York City, does Maggie's life completely upend. The flu pandemic in New York City killed 33,000 people in two months. Everything was shuttered. People wore masks out in the streets. Does this sound familiar? School shut down, restaurants shut down, grocery stores shut down. It was a very difficult time. And the flu pandemic lasted from the fall well into the spring. It went through a second surge where more people um, contracted the flu and died. What was so devastating about the 1918 flu is that it didn't affect children and it didn't affect the very old. The victims were all healthy young adults in their 30s, 40s, or 50s. And because we did not yet have any kind of vaccines or antibiotics, the victims of the flu pandemic could come down with the flu one day and they could actually be dead two days later. It left thousands and thousands of children as orphans in New York City because both of their parents had succumbed to the flu. Once the pandemic comes into New York City, Maggie's life changes tremendously because not only is she trying to figure out how she can right the wrongs of the sweatshop, industry, she now realizes she, have to, she has to survive the uh, pandemic flu herself. So I want you to look at the cover of this. This is Washington Square, which is the iconic symbol of Greenwich Village. It hugs the um, Washington Square Park. And I was very lucky because I went to um, Greenwich Village and I lived there for an entire week. I went and ensconced myself into the Washington Square Hotel and I pretended that I was a native villager, and I went everywhere for the scenes that I have written in the book. Now, if you look at this and look two blocks to the east, that is the old hanging tree, and that appears in my book. And if you walk two blocks to the west, that's where the Ash Building is. And the Ash Building, A-S-C-H, was the original site of the um, Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Today, it is a classroom building for New York University, NYU. And there is a plaque on the building, but that's the only thing that marks where the fire had been, where the women dropped, to, uh, jumped out of the windows. So I felt very, um, I felt that I had to be there in person so that I could experience a lot of the places that Maggie would have gone to. The, um, while I was there, I spent time walking through the park every day, as the villagers do. And it was there that I met Gladys, the pigeon woman. And she was such a character with pigeons literally lighting on her shoulders, her arms, her hat, um, that I designed a character just for Gladys. And she becomes a character in the book as well. The cover of this book has been done by a very uh, notable Greenwich Village artist, Val Fox. I created him to be a character as well. I named him Vincent Fox. And his, his estate gave me permission to use Val's painting of um, Washington Square Arch so I could use it for the cover of my book. 
while I was there in Greenwich Village um, researching everything, I had a wonderful help from a wonderful man, Ronnie, the concierge at the Washington Square Hotel. And the very first day I introduced myself, I told Ronnie the book I was researching and what I wanted to do. And every day he would help me with just wonderful stories that just don't appear anywhere in the textbooks or the, or the journals that I had been studying. For example, he led me outside the hotel one day and we walked, a, 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 I don't know, maybe about 30 yards down and he pointed to an apartment building. He said, you see that apartment building? I said, yes. He said, look up there. He said, do you see up there? It's about three floors down from the top. I said, yes. He said, that's where Eleanor Roosevelt had her own private apartment. And when she just couldn't take FDR one more day, she came to the village and she would live here for weeks by herself, which I never knew. And he said that was her private apartment. I said, okay. So he would keep telling me these really interesting stories. It also was very touching to me because Washington Square Hotel was three doors down from where my parents had their wedding and reception. My mother and father um, were in the met in Greenwich Village, and if you read the book, you'll find out more about that. I was born in the village. I lived there till I was five. The apartment building is still there where I lived as a toddler, and I used that apartment building to be the setting for where Maggie and her aunt live uh, during the time of the book. Back at the Washington Square Hotel, I was finished in a week. I had gotten all my research done, and Ronnie said to me, are you, uh, are you happy? Did you get everything? I said, yeah, everything except one. I said, there was an old restaurant here, doesn't exist anymore, where uh, Hemingway used to go and eat, and I just so badly wanted to go to that location, and I just never made it. And he said, well, why do you want, what do you want to do about Hemingway? And I said, I, I'd like to go where other famous authors have lived and just kind of soak up their spirit. So he said, come on, back into the hotel. So we go back into the hotel, we get in the elevator, go up to the third floor, he takes me to this door. He says, put your hand on the door, I put my hand on the door. He said, this was Hemingway's room anytime he was here in Greenwich Village to write. He said, so you're touching the door that Hemingway touched, and that gives you some good juju. I said, wow. And then Ronnie said to me, there are a lot of famous people who stayed in this hotel. Have you ever heard of the mamas and the papas? I said, of course I know the mamas and the papas said, come on. So we climbed up one more flight to the fourth floor, went to another room, and he said, this is the room where they composed California Dreaming, their very famous song, while they stayed here uh, at the Washington Square Hotel. So I had a wonderful time the week I lived there. It gave me tremendous information. There's nothing like going to the real spot when you are an author and are writing something that is historical. Part of the story takes place out in Coney Island. So my husband and I got on the um, Subway, we went out to Coney Island, spent the day there walking around, making sure that everything I had written and everything I saw in my mind really did exist. There was another, several significant scenes at the Greenwich House, which, is, uh, which was set up for immigrants. It's a senior center today. And so I went there, introduced myself, said I'm writing a book uh, that I knew the Greenwich House had been uh, uh, there for immigrants back in the 1918s. And then I said, I needed to use the ladies' room. And could I go down the hall and use the ladies' room? And the woman said to me, well, sure, but the ladies' room is only on the second floor. And I thought, oh, my gosh, now I have to rewrite one entire scene where I had Maggie going to the ladies' room down the hall, and it was actually on the second floor. So there's nothing like going into the real space that you're writing about to make sure that your details are extremely uh, accurate. Back to counting crows. One of the hardest things as a writer is to come up with a really good title. And often the editor will uh, override you and come up with a title that they like better. But for Counting Crows, I convinced my editor, this is the title that belonged to this book, and here's why. It's an old Irish superstition. And if you go to the, any park, but especially in Greenwich Village, you would see that crows are flying down with the pigeons all the time. So here's the superstition. One crow comes down. That means sorrow, but two crows means mirth. Three, there'll be a wedding. Four, there'll be a birth. Five, you'll find some silver. Six, you'll find some gold. But if seven crows alight, there's a secret that can never be told. And there is a deep, dark secret in Counting Crows that you would have to read the book to find out um, that involves Maggie and her aunt and the whole family 
And to the very end of the book, it was a secret that could never be told. So that is the Counting Crows kind of a, a Cliff Notes version of how I wrote it and why I wrote it for the Threads of Courage series. And I thought what we could do is open up for uh, questions about any of the books I've written or about me as a writer or about Greenwich Village. I lived there till I was five. I still go back to visit. Both of my own daughters have always said, gee, it's too bad you left New York City. It would have been an awesome place for you to have an apartment. The apartment that my parents had, I don't, I don't remember this, but my parents would tell the story. They would have uh, all the beds had tuna fish cans under the legs filled with oil. And that was so the cockroaches couldn't climb up the legs of your bed uh, while you were sleeping during the night. That same apartment today, I'm sure, does not have cockroaches. I looked it up on Zillow. It is being listed for $1.4 million, 900 square feet. So questions that you'd like to know about Greenwich Village or me as a writer or any of the three books I've written. Thank you very much. I think I think we're all ready to run away to New York. Um, I am. Uh, Alexander will let me go. I'm sure she won't mind. So. <laughs> but um, while people are, are putting their questions into the chat or the Q and A, whichever you prefer, um, we do have a few that were already put put in. Um, the first is is sort of a bit of a, a greeting. Um, it's, uh, hi, Linda. This is Bonnie McCann. She says hello. <laughs> I know her, Florida. She says she loved the book. Um, one question that we have is what has been the inspiration for the series and in particular, this third volume, what you talked a little bit about that, but if you could maybe talk about what okay. particularly sparked your interest. Great question. So the series, as I said, starts with cut from strong cloth and, um, it's very, I think it's very interesting. So we have to go back about 20 years. I decide that my mom has passed, I, and she would always have these stories of her Irish ancestors, and I decide I want to go to Philadelphia, and I want to put flowers on my great-grandfather's grave, James Nolan. So I call the cemetery, and they tell me that it's not a very good section of Philadelphia anymore, and I make, and make sure I have a man with me to protect me when I come. So my husband drives up with me, and we get to the cemetery. The caretaker meets us. And he says, come on, I'll show you. So this is an old Irish Catholic cemetery, Northeast Philadelphia. So we start walking through the cemetery and up ahead, there's a very small mausoleum and the name Nolan is on it. And he said, this is your family's, this is where they're all buried. And I think, huh, okay. My mother's stories that my great grandfather had money are obviously true because there's no other mausoleum in the cemetery. So I get to the uh, mausoleum and the caretaker says, it's all sealed up but here's a list of everybody buried inside. I said, okay. So he hands me the list and I see James Nolan's names at the top. My great grandmother, Sarah Jane Brady Nolan is next to him on his left. On his right is someone called Mrs. James Nolan. You go down another row of vaults and I recognize a lot of ancestors' names. I recognize uh, my great uncle Dan and his wife. And you keep going down at the very bottom, there were three very small vaults and it just said Nolan children. So I turned back to the caretaker and I said, well, who is this woman that's Mrs. James Nolan at the top? And he says, I have no idea, but she has to be family or she can't be in the vault. And I'm thinking, okay, there's James Nolan, my great-grandfather, Sarah Jane Brady Nolan, my great-grandmother. So who is this Mrs. James Nolan? And I said, could it have been his mother or a cousin? Or and he said, no clue. So I start thinking about it. We leave the cemetery and, uh, the last thing he said was called the, uh, the Diocese of Philadelphia. So I called the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, Catholic Diocese, and I explained, I'm trying to figure out who this woman is, and they have no clue. They say the same thing. Well, she had to be a family member or she couldn't have been buried in the mausoleum. So I said, okay. So then I said, well, how am I going to find out? So they just keep shoving me into, you know, call this person, call this person, which I do. And eventually the last person in charge of all the cemeteries says to me, there's an archivist out in Wynwood, Pennsylvania, and her, her entire job is doing uh, genealogical records for the Catholic Church of Philadelphia. Try her. So I write to her. I explain, you know, my great-grandfather's James Nolan. This person next to him is called Mrs. James Nolan. No clue who she is. And um, Christine Friend, the archivist, writes back, and she says, um, for $25, I'll research it. So she does. And about six weeks later, I get a letter. It says, Dear Linda. Her name was Ellen Canavan. 
She was your great grandfather's first wife. Here's a copy of their marriage certificate. Here's a copy, three baptism certificates for their children. Uh, if I could help you. So I sit there stunned because I'm thinking, no, his wife was Sarah Jane Brady Nolan, my great grandmother. And I call my father in Florida and I said, Dad, how many wives did James Nolan have? My father says, just one, Sarah Jane Brady. He said, no, Dad, I've got a marriage certificate here that was somebody called Ellen Canavan. So I start thinking about it. And at first I got very angry because I thought, how unfair that she was buried with his name for identification, not hers. And she literally just vanished from history when she was buried. And then I thought, start researching her. So I start researching her and the Canavan family. And the more I researched her, the more enthralled the story became. And I just was just amazed at what I was learning. How she had wanted to go into business. She had wanted to get a good college. All these things that she couldn't do because they were a poor Irish Catholic family. And then I find in the archives in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, that in her will, she left my great-grandfather, James Nolan, $10,000. This is 1873 when she dies. And I think, how in the world did she amass $10,000 on her own? So then I really dived into it, and I researched her for 10 years and figured out how she had been his business partner. She had put her part of the money aside for him, and then in, this, in her will, she had left him the $10,000. That spurred me not only to write this book, but to start a blog that I've done now for nine years called Strong Women in History. And I profile only women from the past who should have been famous, like Ellen Canavan, but who were not recognized. And the more I have started this, the more I have realized there are thousands. There are thousands of women like Ellen Canavan who did something really inspirational with their life, and nobody ever really gave them much credit for it. Thanks to Ellen Canavan, all soldiers' uniforms in the United States are a blend of cotton and wool. Nobody wears 100% wool anymore. And then once I started Ellen, it was pretty easy just to keep going with the Canavan family because then I researched her brother Patrick's children, which led then, of course, to Last Curtain Call. And then after Last Curtain Call, um, I went with the third generation. So Ellen really was the spark um, that started this entire thing. And I wrote at the very end of uh, Accounting Crows, I mean, very end of uh, Cut from Strong Claw. This is what I wrote. Ellen's fierce determination, courage, and perseverance are all a part of her legacy. And three generations after her, I am the connection that keeps Ellen's story alive. The whispers of bravery and tragedy, triumph and deceit that all sprouted long ago across a wide ocean and upon a foreign shore. Ellen, may you now rest in peace, for every woman deserves to have her story told. And that was, uh, so that's the, a long answer to the question of what was my inspiration um, to start the series and um, go from book to book to book. Yeah, but what what a really wonderful story. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, one thing that was really nice about your your uh, description of how you explored the world that you wrote about in this book um, is going to the place and seeing and touching and talking to people. Um, I'd be curious also, since you've talked about your research, to hear a little bit more about, did you look at any historical records or resources that were particularly helpful or interesting in sort of building that picture for you? I, lo I loved your description. I mean, I didn't love your description of the conditions at the Triangle <laughs> Shirtwaist Factory, but it was so vivid with the patterns and the cotton bales. And I just wondered um, if, if there were any sources that you particularly leave to mind. I did. I, I read a tremendous amount. I read books on the uh, Triangle Factory. Uh, I read books on the 1918 pandemic. I had no, I knew there had been a Spanish flu, but I had no idea how devastating it had been. I read an entire book on the um, on the 1918 pandemic. And the most sobering fact I read was that at the end, the um, virus finally just died out, but there is no cure for influenza still this day. And they predicted 100 years ago at the end of the 1918 flu that it would resurrect itself within 100 years. And here we are in 2020 with the COVID virus. So um, the parallels between those two were amazing. 
I went to a lot of research libraries, of course, including Thomas Balch. Um, I went to libraries all throughout wherever I went. I spent a lot of time at libraries in Philadelphia. In fact, um, you might enjoy hearing this little tidbit about me. So we went to the Free Library of Pennsylvania that has a wonderful um, map division. And I went upstairs and I met the um, librarian in charge of the maps. And I explained I was trying to do research. I was writing a book trying to research my great grandfather's factory. I didn't know much about it except its address. Um, and so the librarian said to me, well, okay, he says, let's figure out what voting district and what you know enumeration district and all of this it was. So we figured it out. And he said, I'm going to go in the back of the archives. You, you just go out here. So he comes back out and he has this huge, huge book. I mean, really huge book. And he said, these are all the Sanborn fire insurance maps from 1861. And if you're telling me where your great grandfather's factory is, we probably can find it in this book. So I go to reach for the book. And of course, he goes, no, no, no. I'm the only one that can open the pages. He's got white gloves on. And I stand there and I say, OK. And so he's turning the pages very carefully. He says, what's the family name? He said, Nolan, N-O-L-A-N. He says, OK. And he, he keeps going. And what's the address? And I'm, I'm telling him what the address is, what the address was. And all of a sudden, he opens it up to a huge two-page spread, and he goes, ha, ah, I think I find it. I found it. And I looked down, and I realized that my great-grandfather's factory was huge. It took up an entire city block in Philadelphia. And I finally realized all my mother's stories from my childhood were true. And I burst into tears. I started crying. My husband stood there and put his arm around me. And, of course, the librarian looked at me like, whoa. He said, I've had people say, thank you. He said, I've had people say, gee whiz. He said, I've never had anybody burst into tears. And I said, but this validates everything. And I said, is there any way that I can get a copy of any of this? Because it's such fragile paper and everything. And he said, not today. He said, but I will send it to you. And he, through whatever magic librarians can do, he copied both pages of the schematic of the factory down to the nth detail so that I knew every single room uh, and when I started writing the story, that that just, you know, that brought everything to light. When, uh, and again, this is still cut from strong plot, but when I realized that um, James and Ellen had left Savannah and had to come back to um, Washington, D.C., I went to another library in Alexandria, and I told them I was trying to trace the, uh, trace the, the, the journey, and the librarian said, well, you're in luck, because there's a guy sitting here today who's a... Uh, a noted train enthusiast, and he can tell you all about what the railroads were back in 1861. So I sit down with the man, and the first thing he says, well, you know, Lincoln had an embargo on the steamship, so it was two days after the Civil War started, they could not come back on the steamship. And I said, okay, so they would have come back on, on, on the railroad, and he said, uh, yeah, he said, but they probably would have only gotten as far as Fredericksburg. And I said, well, then what would have happened? And he said, then they would have had to go by horse and wagon to come back to uh, Washington, D.C. So I said, OK. So in my mind, I'm thinking, OK, this is changing everything. So then I said, OK, so then they come through Alexandria and they just go across the bridge into D.C. And he goes, oh, no, 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 that bridge didn't exist back in the Civil War. He said they would have had to travel five miles up the Potomac River to the Long Bridge to get into D.C. And I'm thinking to myself, who knew all these details? Thank goodness for libraries and librarians who have all these uh, primary documents that you can, can research. So then Jim and I actually took a trip and we went to Savannah and we drove their route from Savannah all the way up to Alexandria so that we knew exactly what they had seen, where they had spent the night in the woods, different uh, things to make it as um, as authentic as possible. And the same thing with Counting Crows. Um, I went to the New York Public Library. I did a lot of work on the, uh, the Greenwich Village Preservation Society helped me. Um, because the more you research and the more accurate you can be, then the more the story comes to life. Um, and that's one of the things I'm very proud about. Almost all of the reviews in my books, people say, I felt like I was right there because the details were so uh, authentic, and I felt like I was right there with the characters. In fact, one of the best reviews I've ever had was from Homer Hickman, uh, and he is the one who wrote Rocket, well, October Sky and Rocket Boys, best-selling uh, author in the New York uh, New York Times. And I sent with my 
last curtain call because it takes place in a coal mining village, I wrote to him and asked him if he would um, give me an endorsement. And his endorsement was, uh, I'm trying to find the endorsement. His endorsement basically says, when you read one of Linda Siddick's books, you feel like you're sitting down and talking with the characters, which coming from somebody like Homer Hickman was a tremendous compliment. So I do go to libraries. I do use primary documents as much as possible. Diaries, anything I can get my hands on. Um, and thank goodness again, I will say for libraries and librarians. Great. We're, we're not going to disagree with you about that. <laughs> Um, I, I love I, I, the idea of someone coming to tears over the Sanborn and fire insurance maps. It was beautiful, though. They, they were such wonderful resources um, and probably the best thing, side effect of insurance that ever happened. <laughs> right. And they had, their details were so detailed on the schematic map. It even showed where the leather water buckets hang hung on the walls because, of course, they didn't have metal, I guess, water buckets in the factories. I don't know. Fire was a huge problem in all of the factories, not just Philadelphia, but everywhere. And my great grandfather's factory did have a devastating fire uh, at one point where um, it's a brick building, so the building didn't burn, but lost a lot of the uh, uh, the interior to it. And I am proud to say that the uh, his building, again, the um, the factory is now on the historic registry uh, in Philadelphia. It is now luxury condos, <laughs> but it's still standing, and that's the important. Thing. Very cool. So we have one question left, and then there's t still time if anyone out there would like to add a few more. But um, someone has inquired, um, let's see, if you have any new works on the horizon or any new ideas that are you're exploring. Oh, perfect segue. Hold on. So my newest book came out just uh, a few weeks ago. It is not part of the Th uh, Courage of um, Threads of Courage series. It is a nonfiction book called B52 Down. Very different from anything I have ever written and completely different way of how uh, I started writing this. I was at a book signing for um, Last Curtain Call and a man came up in Cumberland, Maryland, and a man came up out of the audience and said to me, I know this wonderful story about a B-52 bomber that crashed outside of Frostburg, Maryland in 1964 with a excuse me, five-man crew and two nuclear bombs on board. And I said, wow. And he said, you know, you'd be the perfect person to write the book. <laughs> and I said, well, I, I don't do military, and I don't write about men. I write about strong women. And he said, well, all five guys had wives. So we chuckled about that, and I said, well, I'm, I'm just getting ready to um, start my third book in you know, Threads of Courage series. I can't take on anything new now. But he said, well, let's swap emails. And we did. So every three months, he wrote to me, how are you coming along with your last book? When, when can you consider B-52? And then finally, last year, um, I, I, I had wrapped up uh, Counting Crows. Uh, it was in the middle of the pandemic, and he wrote to me, and he said, look, he said, um, there's two girls coming up from Louisiana. Their uncle was one of the got one of the five man crew on the B fifty two that went down. Wanted, would you like to meet them? And I said, all right. So we drove up to Frostburg and we met them. And we sat in a hotel lobby with masks on our face for three hours. And the more the two women talked, they're my age. The more they talked, the more I realized the real story was the human interest story. So just to give you a quick overview of it. It's 1964. We're in the middle of the Cold War with Russia. The B-52 bombers are the largest airplane ever uh, built by Boeing for the American military. And it's a balmy 55 degree weather Sunday afternoon in Albany, Georgia, when the five man crew at Turner Air Force Base gets the call that they need to uh, go up to Massachusetts, to Chicopee, Massachusetts, and pick up a B-52 that needs repairs and bring it back to Georgia. And the men were supposed to have Sunday off, but they all, you know, go back on base, kiss their wives, hug their kids, and they uh, take a military transport and they fly up to um, Massachusetts and they pick up the plane. And at 12.30 a.m., they get on, uh, they're all suited up, they're in the plane, and they start the return flight back to Georgia. An hour into the flight, however, 
they uh, there is a storm which they've been trying to avoid, but the storm shifts, and instead of being able to fly around it, above it, underneath it, the storm slams into them, and it is an Arctic blizzard. They are over Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania. Um, plane the B-52, which is called its call number is Buzz One Four, is going 500 miles an hour. The Arctic blizzard has wind shears of 167 miles an hour. The blizzard slams into the airplane and shears off the back tail. When the back tail shears off, there's not a stabilizer, so the B-52 flips upside down into a spiral. And the crew realizes they have no alternative except to eject. So they eject out of the plane into an Arctic blizzard. That, and the plane goes on without them, still at 500 miles an hour. The men are strapped to their ejection seats. They are tumbling through the blizzard. They eject at 30,000 feet, which is unheard of. Um, their parachutes won't even deploy until they get down to 12,000 feet. They have to get to 10,000 feet to be able to breathe on their own without oxygen. And when the, man, when the men land, all five of them land about two miles away from each other, and they land in the, river, the Savage River State Park forest, 52,000 acres of mountains, treacherous mountains in Western Maryland. In fact, tourists often call them the Maryland Alps because they're so beautiful in the spring and summer. But the aviation people in Western Maryland call it the graveyard of the Alleghenies because there have been so many um, tragic um, crashes. So the five men do uh, make it to Earth, but not near each other. They're not dressed for an Arctic blizzard. They remember, it was 55 degrees when they left Albany. What happens is that um, the military, of course, the plane does eventually crash and explode, and the uh, military comes out because there's two nuclear bombs on board. They know the five men were in the plane, so now a huge rescue attempt comes out. There are a 1,000 volunteers, and they spend five days searching the wilderness area to locate all five men. There were Marines, Air Force, Army, uh, Civil Air Patrol, that hundreds of people off the mountain came up down a local community to try and locate the five men. Meanwhile, their wives are all still back in, in, uh, in Georgia. Uh, they know their men, their husbands are missing. They know the plane has exploded and crashed, but nobody knows what has happened to the five men. So that was the story I decided to write from the human interest of what was going on with the wives. Of course, I profiled the five men who were the crew, and then I profiled all of the people who were involved in the rescue attempts. And again, talking about uh, what type of research, I was able to actually interview 30 people who were involved in the rescue attempts on snowshoes and helicopters, asked them what it had been like when they tried to go out. The blizzard went on for another two days, 11 degrees out, uh, snow three feet high. Um, it was, it's since then, it has been called the blizzard of the century. So this is the brand new book. It is um, right now, only available in um, certain um, independent bookstores up in Cumberland and Frostburg, Maryland. Um, and it's also available in Kindle and in print um, from Amazon. But I am very proud of it. The families of all of the five men uh, I was able to interview, and all of them thanked me over and over for bringing the story to life. So, so glad you asked the question, because B-52 Down um, is my newest work. Totally nonfiction. I, uh, this time, I had to really, it wasn't just libraries that I had to go to. I had to go to the United States Air Force and talk to pilots and mechanics of how did this airplane work? What, how long does it take from the time you hit an ejection button to you you shoot out of the airplane? What, you know, what happens to you while you're in free fall? Tremendous amount of technical knowledge that I had to then distill and write so it would be interesting to the reader. And two nuclear bombs are on board this airplane. Just to give you an idea of the potential devastation, the bombs that we dropped on Hiroshima were 15,000 kilotons. There are two nine mega million tons on the B-52 bomb, two of them. So there was a tremendous amount at stake with the crash and with the five-man uh, crew and with all of the... Um, people that joined in, in in the rescue attempts. And I'm still getting emails from people saying, I was 10 years old. I remember I woke up and the sky was red and I thought the world was ending. So it's still a, a very poignant 
memory for a lot of people up in the Frostburg Cumberland area. So whoever had that question, thank you. Great, great segue. Awesome. That that sounds like a, a dramatic story. <laughs> this is more of a, and somebody said, oh, I think guys will be interested in this one. So yeah, great. No, I I I I I'm interested. <laughs> Yeah, but I know a few people. It's, an ama- it's a truly an amazing story, and not because I wrote it, but just how it brought the community together. And not, no one in the community knew these five men; they were all from Georgia. And what they did to um, try and find them is just—it's um, a page turner. I will say. A lot of people have said I started the book and I couldn't put it down. I read it till I finished it because it's not a long, long book. It's 122 pages. And it was the first time I ever did, had to do photographs. And oh, what a learning curve that was. Because I very uh, innocently thought of, if there's a photograph on the internet, you can use it. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> there were copyrights and some I could use. And one, I won't mention who, but one historical association said, yes, you can use this copyright, but it's $75 per incident or something. So I said, we don't have that kind of money. Um, so some of the photographs didn't make it. There were one or two that the my publisher felt were too um, controversial for the United States Air Force, and so that they were taken out also. So big learning curve for me with uh, how to how to incorporate photos and give credit. Interesting, because um, it's kind of a different time period that, than you'd been working in most recently. So. Definitely. <laughs> so new yeah, challenges. I, of course, I didn't grow up in the area, so I don't know. My husband. Um, grew up in the Cumberland Prosperg area and he remembered he was working night shift at the AMP and uh, he said yeah he remembered when it happened so interesting okay well um thank you and and something to look forward to a new book to to seek out um I am gonna go ahead and put up our our information about where to find um your your current books and um so people can see that hopefully Uh, this will work it doesn't look like it's doing it but uh, (laughs) oh goodness here we go Try this one more time. There we go. Um, so hopefully everyone yeah. can see uh, the information here. Um, and I don't see any additional questions, but is there anything else, Linda, that you would like to share with us before we, we wrap up for today? Not really. I want Obviously, I want to say thank you to the whole staff at Thomas Balch for all the research help I've been given in the past and for hosting me today. Well, well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is really interesting, and I look forward to to picking up your your books and and especially um, this new book that you just told us about. That sounds really int- really great. Um, I have to take a look. Um, th- thank you very much, um, and you. we hope to see you again soon. <laughs>